Lord's blessings to all of you. It's so nice to see so many of you here this morning. Now let's begin our time together with a word of prayer, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings this day. And as we eagerly await the coming of your Son <clears throat> on this Christmas Eve this evening, uh, let us focus on your coming today during this time of Advent yet. Uh, Lord, bless us with a King, with your King who is to come, a good and righteous King, a good and holy King, a King who will lead over us uh, and, and who will love us as his people. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Today, fill us up with your good things, with your word and your sacrament. Fill us up with the praises and prayers of your people. Lord, we thank you and, and we ask that you would fill us up with good things so we can go out into the world and share that love of Jesus Christ, especially this day, the day the Lord comes into the world as a baby lying in a manger. Give us the strength and the temerity, the resolve to share that good news of Jesus Christ with those who who are around us, who are part of our lives, who are even family members, who are our neighbors and friends. Uh, all this we ask in Jesus' name, and we pray, amen. We begin with our first hymn. stand, I might encourage you, if we have any guests and visitors this morning, to use the, uh, the hymnal ribbon system. It's very helpful for navigating the hymnal. I always put the red ribbon on the divine service or the service of the day. That would be page 203. And then I take the yellow ribbon. I put that for the psalm of the day, which today is Psalm 89. That way, when you get to that part in the service, it's very easy just to flip open by using the ribbons uh, in your hymnal. Uh, kind of like this. You take the red ribbon, you can flip open to the divine service, and then when it's time for the psalm, you can flip open to the psalm. Uh, it just makes it a little easier for those who are visiting with us to navigate the hymnal. Please stand. We turn to page 203 in your hymnal, and we use the setting of divine service 4. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed 
and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, being that it is Advent, we skip over the Gloria today and go straight to the salutation and call it. We do sing our Kyrie. You'll find the call to the day printed on page 5 of your bulletin. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for our readings. Again, just to clarify, maybe you were coming today expecting Christmas Eve stuff. It is still technically the fourth Sunday of Advent. So we will be using the fourth Sunday of Advent readings and the Christmas readings this evening. Uh, so we begin with 2 Samuel chapter 7. And all of our readings, including our psalm today, focus on the monarchy and the hope of a new king who is to come. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people, Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them, so that they will dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson for today is taken from Romans chapter 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Be we stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. 
Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom... There will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. We speak together now the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. May be seated. We have our children come forth for a children's message. Good morning. So glad to see all of you up here this morning. Uh, Blessings to you. We have this Sunday of Advent, and today we're going to talk a little bit about Mary. Now, before I get started, is anybody up here? Is anybody up here named Mary? Anybody named Mary? Nobody? Really? I bet you there's some Marys out there in in the in the congregation. Maybe not as popular a name as it used to be. Should be. It's a wonderful name. You know, we talk a little bit about Mary, and uh, the angel calls her "O favored one." Uh, and and uh, she is uh, she's kind of seen very importantly as a special woman who this special honor is given to bear the, the Son of, of God, to bear Jesus Christ. Now sometimes, and, and you probably don't know this, but maybe all your parents out there or maybe your grandparents, they're, they're, um, they're getting a little itchy around the collars because Lutherans aren't supposed to talk about Mary. Yeah? But... There's something very important about Mary, and I want to show it to you in the, in the reading today. And I, I think this is why Mary is, is favored, okay? The angel comes and tells her an amazing thing, okay? 
Now, I, now I'm not going to discuss this thing because I'll leave it to your parents. But suffice to say, when you have children, it takes a mom and a dad. And what the angel tells Mary is, this baby is going to be conceived from the Holy Spirit. This baby is going to be God. Now, what if someone came to you and said, hey, you know what? You're going to have a baby, and it's going to be God. And you go, what? Right? Uh, well, that's not what Mary says. He says to this to her, and, 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 and uh, she was greatly troubled to saying, tried to discern what was going on. And the angel says, do not be afraid. And he tells her all this amazing stuff. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he's going to be all these things. And Mary's question is, well, how can this be? Because I don't have a husband yet. How can I have a baby? And the, and the angel says, well, it'll be because of the Holy Spirit. And then Mary answers at the end of all this. She says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That is amazing. Now I'm going to ask you a couple questions here. Um, I talk a lot about baptism, and I tell you that when you were a baby, you were baptized, and when you were baptized, the Lord Jesus Christ gave you eternal life and salvation. He put a wellspring of holy water growing and living in your very person, and you might say to me, what? That's crazy. Right? But it's not crazy, is it? No. No. And why, why do you think it is when we tell you these things, you don't say, that's crazy? Because you have faith. You have faith that trusts that when God says something, when God says in his holy word something, he means it. And so the one thing I see from this reading is what? Mary has great faith. She trusts in the Lord. That's a beautiful thing. There's all kinds of crazy things in this world that don't make any sense. How is it that this guy up here called your pastor stands in front of you and he says this thing, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're like, well, that's not how the world works. If you get caught with a crime, you go to jail and you spend time there. You have to pay for your sins. You have to pay for the things you do wrong. But your pastor says, no, God forgives you because he loves you. That's crazy. We might sit out there and go, what? But instead we accept it by faith. We trust that the Lord loves us. He has grace and mercy for us. That his baptism is real. That he creates wellsprings of eternal life and the Holy Spirit that a sacrament, this thing that is bread and wine, is Christ's body and his blood. There's all kinds of mysteries when we come here. All kinds of mysterious, crazy things that we could spend all day in church just going, what? But instead, but instead, the Lord gives us faith. And with faith, we can accept things that are beyond our understanding. Just like Mary, who said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow. That's great faith. Should we pray? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. We thank you for Mary, who had great faith and accepted the words the angel told her. And we're so thankful for Jesus who has come to give us salvation and eternal life, and the Holy Spirit who gives us faith, who has faith welling up within us. Lord, help us by faith to trust and believe in things that do not make sense, that are crazy, but rather are things, miraculous things that you do for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Thank you so much for coming up. You're going to turn to your seats. And we sing our sermon hymn.
mercy and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, I'm a little out of practice, obviously, doing liturgy because I skipped over the psalm entirely. So if you want to open to the psalm, Psalm 89 in your hymnal, verses 1 through 5, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a, cho a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. We have for the past weeks been just focusing on the psalm of a day during Advent and talking about the Lord's coming and the restoration it will bring. And for those of you who haven't been here or those of you who have forgotten, restoration in the Hebrew sense is not simply putting things back where they once were. I kind of described it as like an HGTV reality where not only will we restore everything back the way it once was, but everything will be updated, shiny, modern, and new. That's what restoration means in the Old Testament in Hebrew. We don't get much of Psalm 89. If you noticed there as you open up the psalm, it's a rather long one. It takes up two full pages in the, in the hymnal there. Uh, we only get the first five verses to obviously go with the theme of kingship and lordship of this day of Advent. Uh, I say, blame the lectionary committee. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, this is what we get. And uh, you haven't read the entirety of Psalm 89. Maybe I can kind of condense it for you a little bit. Psalm 89 is a psalm of restoration. And its content is a clear, clear hope that God will restore his people once again. Inside the psalm, we get hints. If you look closely to verse 30, for example, um, we get hints that this psalm is post-David, possibly post-Solomon, because it refers to his kings who did sit on the throne, who didn't follow God's law and his ways that he wanted his people to be. Um, it doesn't show a great side of both of these men. After David and Solomon, of course, the history of Israel in the north, uh, in Israel in the north and Judah in the south, was, was that these two sister countries more often had bad rulers than good ones. Psalm 89 spends a lot of time then meditating on the greatness of the Lord, his power, his great deeds, his holiness, and his righteousness. The psalmist is doing what God loves recounting his great mercy and his love for his people, his mighty deeds and miraculous salvation. Of course God wants us to recount these deeds. And it is in recounting them that we can realize 
that God heard his people in the Old Testament. He heard them once. He will hear us again. He restored their fortunes once, and surely enough, he will do it again. In Psalm 89, the idea of restoration focuses on the king and the throne of Israel. Who is God going to set on that throne to restore everything? Now, why does the throne matter? Why do I care about a good king as opposed to a bad one? Well, maybe you're into uh, various sci-fi shows right now and you're really excited about kings and queens and all kinds of medieval stuff. Maybe not. Even though we've moved out of that period of history, we still deal with leaders who are over us. Leaders who direct our nations and make decisions. And often they are not good decisions. Often they can be bad. If you've ever read First and Second Kings, it is a song that has a refrain, and the refrain goes something like this. But so-and-so, you, you in the blank put in the king, right? But so-and-so did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Kings are put on the throne by God. So they um, can either trust God or not trust God. And usually that is how they're judged. Not by their political achievements, not by their financial or market achievements. They're judged on whether they trusted God or not. If you read the stories of the kings, it seems as almost they are trying to outdo one another. If one king is good, the next king, uh, uh, he's good, he tears down the idols, he tries to get people worshiping God again, the next king comes along and tries to do as much evil to undo the good or even more. He puts the idols back up and he puts a few more just for, just for good sake. The next king does everything he can do to undo all the good and make things worse. And this is the issue. This is the place where we find ourselves caught in a boat with no anchor, tossed about to and fro. One king is good, the next king is bad. There is no consistency, there is no basic righteousness. And what I mean is that something that is unthinkable to do under the reign of good king Josiah is acceptable under the terrible king Manasseh. How can a people tossed about in the waves know what is righteous in the current regime? It's not just the people of the Old Testament, however. We deal with these problems as well. Around the world, we can see sad refrains of ethnic cleansing and despotic rule. One dictator is deposed or a military coup rises up only to place yet another evil ruler who does not listen to the Lord on the throne. The people of Israel had Samuel as their prophet and God as their king, and yet they cried out for an earthly king so they could be like all the other nations. God gave them one, and these rulers were often the reason for their suffering and their shame. Eventually, these rulers, these kings, were the reason for all of the problems that they were in. What kingdom do we live in? The kingdom to come or this kingdom of fallen creation and broken dreams? We live in a world where we should always seek righteousness. We live in a world where we should fight for the rights of the unborn. We live in a world that needs to know the truths of creation that are contained in Holy Scripture. We broke marriage. We broke parenting. We broke loving our neighbors and in the Scriptures, God has given us all that we need to understand and do. The truth is, is that we should fight for what is right in the world but we should also remember that this world is fleeting. Eternity is coming. And in the new heavens and the new earth, God will reign supreme on his throne forever. We will see him as he is. We will see him face to face. And he will be the ruler that we always longed for. Perhaps our actions and thoughts betray us. For we worship at the temple of government. We worship at the altar of progressivism and political correctness. Why, if we call everything by its proper name, everything will be okay. Why, if we just clean out all these Republicans or clean out all these Democrats from government, why, everything will finally work the way it's supposed to. 
If we just get the right cases in front of the right judges instead of relying on the human decency of men, we all sink to the same game of power and manipulation. And secretly, somewhere we may not want to express or admit, we hold out hope for some kind of earthly savior who will come and make the world nice again. And that is our folly. That is our idol worship. For we forget the human problem. We forget sin. Find as many governors or senators or presidents as you want. Look for righteous judges or soldiers with integrity. And what will you have? Just another group of sinners. Another group of men and women with weaknesses and failures like the rest of us. Our modern day thoughts are much the same as Israel. We cry out to the Lord, Lord, just give us an honest man. Give us a leader with integrity and humbleness. Give us a man with strength and power to get things done. And the Lord shakes his head. I did. I gave you that man. You rejected him. The people he was sent to rejected him. They hated him for telling the truth. And for many of the same reasons, you hate him and I hate him as well. He tells the truth about marriage. He tells the truth about sacrifice. He tells the truth about possessions and money. He tells the truth about pursuits and not letting anything, no sport, no activity, no pursuit, or even job should get in the way of your trust in him. And you hate him for it. Christ called you to a higher level of service and care and trust, and you laugh at the request. You think to yourself, surely he doesn't mean that. Surely Christ doesn't expect us to live like that and act like that. Surely he doesn't expect me to give this up. This is the modern world after all. It's not the first century anymore. And finally we can see where our flawed rulers and legislators and leaders and kings come from. They come from us. They are flawed, because we are. And yet we keep asking our Lord for one more, one more person who will fix all this mess. When confronted with hate, bigotry, death, sickness, impossible situations, and opportunities to seek out fame and power at every stop, at every opportunity, Jesus chose what was right, what was true. And when he told the truth, when they asked him if he was the king to come, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? He answered as he always did, with truth and integrity, knowing just what would happen. Jesus was the king we have longed for. He was the king of humility and service. He told his disciples to be the greatest, they must be the least. What kind of king desires to be the least? He was a king of love who heard the cries of the homeless and the poor, the desperate pleas of the sick and the paralyzed. He did not neglect his people, but served them to the point of exhaustion. He was a king of power and might, who walked on waves, who fed thousands, who stood up to the powers that be and resisted the temptations of the devil. He was the king of grace and mercy who forgave the sins of his people and took those sins upon himself. Every sin that he forgave was one more lash, one more point of punishment for him to endure. He forgave sins with compassion and love. And to complete our salvation, he gave up his flesh to be tortured by the evil emperor of Rome and the king of hell and lies. This is the king that Samuel told us. In your house, your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. 
The only throne we gave him was that. This is what the psalmist longs for. This ruler, this king who was to come. And finally, through eons of time, we see him. See him in our gospel lesson for the first time. And behold, you will, rec- you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. We always worry. Yeah? It's always that time period in November and December where the markets flutter because of who might occupy the office, right? We've elected a new president. We're not sure what's going to happen. We're not sure what's going to We live in this world where every four years we worry about what the next president is going to bring. Not in Jesus' reign. Not in his kingdom. Never again to worry. He's delivering a new kind of kingdom. One without fears. One without inconsistencies. One with holiness and righteousness. One with grace and mercy. One where we don't need to wonder all the time what this new king will be like. Will he be like the old one? Or will everything be different? No, it will be grace and mercy and forgiveness and joy and peace forever. And through repentance and forgiveness, through faith and trust, through baptism and the word, we are part of this kingdom. I tell you today, fight for God's creation. Fight for righteousness and justice. But know that Christ is coming soon. And all this will pass away. We live with one foot in the kingdom of this world and one foot in the kingdom of tomorrow. Having one foot in that kingdom, that kingdom of tomorrow, makes it easier to leave our other foot in the here and now. But one day, one day the Lord will come and he will raise us up and we will put both feet down perfect feet, new feet, perfect bodies, perfect righteousness. We will put both feet down in a new kingdom. A perfect one. One of righteousness. Living under a gracious and humble and loving king. Jesus Christ. Lord, restore us. Lord, restore your kingdom. Lord, thank you for restoration and a new king. The kind of king we have longed and dreamed for. Thanks be to God for this restoration. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, and establishing in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy, grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and to those who hold office in your church that by, your devoted, by their devoted service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy, send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel, both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy, preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity 
Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of this state, and to all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> bless our schools. Especially we ask that you would bless our Sioux Falls Lutheran grade school and our Sioux Falls Lutheran high school. Bless all the schools of our church, all colleges, universities, and centers of research, and those who teach and work in them. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Sanctify our homes with your presence and bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Let your blessing remain upon the seed time and harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and be with all who put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. We remember Virginia, Lonnie, Glenn, Cal, Bob, Tina, Roberta, Ruth, Clifford, Janet, Mary, Oliver, Tom. We also remember Ron. We also remember the Robert Johnson family as he has recently passed away. Bring consolation to those in sorrow and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy. We remember with thanksgiving those who, have lo those who have loved and served you in your church on earth and who now rest from their labors. Keep us in fellowship with all the saints and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. If you seated, this time we would have our offer.
we continue with the service of the sacrament found in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and sing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabbath, adored, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> this do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We share the peace of Christ with one another as a family in Christ. You may be seated.
O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Maybe see it for our closing hymn. I'd like to give some uh, special, okay, she's up there, good. Some special uh, uh, directions for this hymn. So open up this hymn 370. And, and at 370 you should have a, a little piece of music glued into the hymnal next to it. How many of you have that? Raise your hand. You got that all? Those people? Okay. Some of them have fallen out, so if you don't have it, just grab another hymnal. It should be in there. And, and what this is, is this is a partner song with What Child Is This? Okay? So how we're going to do this is that we are going to sing verse 1 of What Child Is This? And then verse 1 of Child of the Poor, and verse 2 of What Child Is This? Verse 2 of Child of the Poor. And then on verse 3, this side is going to sing, let's see, who do I got over here? Yeah, this side will sing What Child Is This? And this side is going to sing Child of the Poor. We're going to do this together as a partner song. We've done this before, so don't freak out. We'll do our best. And uh, uh, you folks will sing What Child Is This? And I'll sing with all you on Child of the Poor on verse 3. Okay, so we sing verse 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 2, verse 3 together. Clear as mud? Okay, let's give it a shot. Go ahead, Kathy. <laughs>
day, this last day of Advent, and tonight, of course, is our celebration for Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., uh, a service of carols and readings, and we thoroughly, uh, we very much enjoy, uh, uh, invite you to come and be part of that this evening. Um, I don't, there's a lot of announcements in your bulletin. I'd ask that you would take a look at them and be aware of, of all of them and what's going on, um, other than just don't forget that we have Christmas Eve service tonight at 5, Christmas Day service with communion tomorrow at 9, and we do have Sunday school and Bible study today downstairs if you would wish to join us. Uh, we'd much enc uh, encourage you to do that, and it will be a uh, Advent slash Christmas uh, Bible study today, so we look forward to having you for that. Lord's blessings on you as we continue his kingdom work and his kingdom feel, and I love you all very much, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Lord's blessings. Thank <laughs> you.